for the introduction and thanks for coming. So yeah, in this talk, I will talk about, uh, we'll continue this theme of uh, approximate counting. And in particular, I will focus on uh, two states in systems. So unlike the last talk, uh, uh, all variables in my talk will be uh, like a boolean, like a zero, one. Uh, so I, I will not talk about like coloring and stuff. OK. Uh, oh, and uh, this is uh, I include some uh, joint work with uh, uh, Pian Lu and uh, Leslie and Goldberg. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so this is the easy model, which is a very uh, classical model, which has been very well studied. Uh, so for the easy model, we have this edge interaction matrix, uh, beta one one beta, uh, where each number encodes the uh, the interaction of the states of the uh, two endpoints of our edge. Uh, so we want. So this is, defines a distribution on the configurations, where each configuration is an assignment uh, from vertices to like a zero one. So each vertex is like a variable, uh, boolean variable, and uh, the interaction is given by this uh, matrix. So if the two endpoints are sort of a zero zero, it gives beta. One one also gives beta, and zero one one zero gives one. Uh, this is the same as the statistical physics uh, easy model. Uh, because we just normalize, all we did is normalize the, the uh, zero one interaction. The different, uh, the interaction when uh, two vertices are different to one, and uh, the other, we denote the other interaction as beta. And the weight of the um, configuration uh, is like a beta to the number of monochromatic edges in the graph uh, under this uh, configuration. And uh, the, uh, the distribution, the measure is uh, uh, proportional to this weight. And here is a concrete example where every vertex is assigned blue or zero, and uh, each edge gives a uh, weight of beta, and this uh, configuration has a weight, weight like a beta to the eighth. And also this is a bipedal graph, so we can give a, a configuration such that it, we can sort of bicolor it, and uh, every edge will contribute to one because every edge is different, so the weight is just a one. And uh, more generally, we have some configuration, we have some weight, and uh, we are interested in the partition function, which is to sum over all possible configurations of their own weights. And the weight is beta to the number of uh, monochromatic edges in this graph. Okay, and we will talk about the complexity of approximating this uh, partition function. Uh, so to recap, this is an easy model, which beta one one beta interaction, and then we have no field on the vertices, so that means we have a, just a weight one for the vertex. Uh, so we will denote this by like a vector one one. So this will be our notation for the edge interaction and the, the vertex weight. And uh, we will talk about a slightly more general uh, two-state spin system where we have three parameters. We have beta, gamma, and the lambda. So beta is the, the uh, zero zero interaction, and the gamma is like one one, and the lambda is the weight of uh, zero vertices. Um, notice that uh, this matrix is still like symmetric. That means zero one and one zero are the same, uh, so the graph is still like undirected. If we make these two different, then the graph will be directed, which uh, is not what I'm going to talk about. Okay, and again, we are interested in uh, approximating this uh, partition function z of beta gamma lambda. So the complexity will depend on the uh, three parameters. Okay. So here are some uh, examples, some well-known uh, systems, such as easy model, which we have seen in the first slide. We get this beta one one beta, and this is a no-field case, so we have a, a no vertex field, so we get just get this weight. And also there's this so-called uh, Halcock gas model, which we have seen in the last uh, talk, uh, which is basically a weighted independent set. Uh, the interaction matrix is zero one one one. Uh, which means if uh, the two endpoints are both assigned zero, uh, then it's not allowed. So zero sort of encodes the uh, occupied vertices. And uh, we have vertex weight of lambda. Uh, so each occupied vertex will contribute a weight of lambda. And uh, the pattern function is a sum over all independent sets of their own weights. And uh, here we sum over independent sets because if it's not an independent set, then uh, this edge interaction will give the weight zero. And uh, so in this talk, we are going to talk about approximate counting. The reason is uh, uh, the exact evaluation of z is the number of hard, unlike some trivial cases, like uh, beta times gamma equals 1, or beta equals gamma equals 0, or like lambda equals 0, uh, for like uh, non-active uh, parameters. Um, 
So for approximate counting, we will be talking about uh, FPRAS and FPTAS, which you uh, should have seen in the previous two talks. Um, so FPTAS is just the deterministic version of uh, FPRAS. And uh, we require the running time is polynomial in N and uh, 1 of epsilon. And by some classical results by Jerome Valent and Raziani, um, approximating the Pellinian function is equivalent to, uh, to approximate the marginal probabilities in this graph. Uh, due to some self-reducibility. So later on, when I talk about uh, uh, algorithms, I will just talk about how to approximate the marginal probabilities. Okay. And uh, before moving on to the results, there's one more uh, distinction of uh, these uh, systems, uh, which are called ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic. Um, so basically, we have this in at induction beta 1, 1 gamma. And uh, if beta times gamma equals 1, then this system is actually trivial because each edge can be decomposed into two uh, half edges, like two unary functions. Uh, so this is a sort of a trivial case. And um, more generally, we have a ferromagnetic uh, uh, of anti-ferromagnetic interaction. For example, for easing, uh, that means beta equals gamma larger than 1, or beta equals gamma less than 1. Uh, when it is ferromagnetic, uh, different neighbors tend to have, uh, in a typical configuration, different neighbors, neighbors tend to have uh, the same uh, spin because their weight is like uh, uh, larger than one if they are equal. Uh, so it's larger than the anti-diagonal. And the anti ferro case is uh, reverse. Uh, neighbors tend to have uh, different spins. And uh, for the more general case, we will uh, distinguish the, uh, depending on whether beta times gamma is larger than one or not. Okay. Uh, so here is the outline of this talk. I will first, the uh, uh, first part will be a survey on anti ferromagnetic two-spin systems. Uh, there's a great advance uh, in recent years. Uh, we more or less completely classified all anti-ferromagnetic two-spin systems. Uh, then we'll report uh, some uh, uh, recent results I had with uh, uh, PN Lu on ferromagnetic two-spin systems. And uh, if I have time, I will uh, move on to talk about uh, how about uh, going beyond uh, like uh, non-negative numbers, uh, talk about uh, a complex weighted uh, easy model. This is joint work with uh, uh, Vasily Goldberg. And uh, in this case, I will be uh, talking about the approximation of the norm of the petition function, uh, because it's not clear how to approximate a complex number. Okay. So first, uh, uh, let me briefly recap like what do we know for anti uh, systems. <coughs> the upshot is that uh, for anti systems, uh, if we have uh, an FP test for the petition function, uh, if and only if <coughs> correlation decay, that's the notion of correlation decay. Um, so that's what I'm going to explain in the next few slides. Um, so again, let's take the Hardcore model as an example. So this is, so our task is now to approximately counting uh, weighted Indian sets. Then for a, uh, so in a bounded degree graph, um, this problem is shown to have a algorithm if lambda is less than lambda c, where lambda c is given by this quantity, uh, Andreas also talked about this in the last talk. Um, and if lambda is larger than lambda c, it is actually NP hard, and we don't really know uh, at the threshold. Uh, we know it's, uh, we can approximate the log Padilla function at the threshold, but uh, the Padilla function itself, we don't know. Um, if beyond lambda c, it's like uh, NP hard to even approximate the log. And this algorithm is due to Weiss in 2006, and the hardness part is due to Sly. Uh, and also Sai and Sun and uh, Delanis uh, Stefankovic and Vigoda. Um, yeah, so next I will explain what this lambda C is. Uh, Andres has already explained it, uh, but I will kind of explain it more from the algorithmic uh, point of view. Um, so this is the uniqueness threshold for Gibbs measures in infinite regular trees, uh, which I denote by T delta. Uh, so we consider the influence of the leaves to the root V, and we will consider sort of two extremal cases when all the leaves are zero or all the leaves are one. Um, so any other case will be uh, between these two extremal cases. So let's say that all leaves are zero uh, because in our encoding, uh, zero means occupied. So the marginal probability at the root, uh, sorry, at the leaf uh, is one. And we can, since it's an independent set, we know that the next level, they must be not occupied. So they are marginal probability is zero, and we can continue this uh, sort of tree recursion 
and until we get the root, we get some number p plus. And in the other case, all leaves are unoccupied, so we can delete them. The next level are all free. Their marginal is like lambda over 1 plus lambda. Again, we can continue this sort of tree recursion computation. We get some number p minus. Then the question is, uh, does this uh, two numbers uh, go to the same or not? Um, so does a limit uh, exist uh, for, for arbitrary boundary conditions? And it turns out uh, the p plus and p minus goes to zero if and only if lambda is less than equal to this lambda c. Um, so here is another uh, picture to try to explain what happens for, for this uh, uh, phenomena. So here is a uh, three regular infinite uh, tree. And uh, if lambda is less than equal to the critical value, then, in fact, uh, every vertex will have the same marginal probability, let's say p star. It will be sort of uniform for all vertices. And if lambda is larger than lambda c, uh, then we will have uh, two different uh, um, extremal uh, typical cases, where uh, in the one case, uh, the even levels will all have a p plus, and all the levels will all have a p minus. But the graph is like a vertex transitive, therefore we can swap them. Uh, we can get a p minus at the root and the even levels, and the p plus at the all levels. Uh, so that means at the leaf, uh, they, they are uh, sort of a p plus or p minus will uh, influence the root uh, being p plus or p minus, even if the distance is very, very long. Um, so, so the boundary have a, a non-negligible uh, influence on the root when lambda is larger than lambda c. Okay. So, so this uh, sort of uniqueness uh, can be formalized as a so-called weak spatial mixing, uh, which says that uh, for two different uh, configurations, two di different uh, sort of boundary conditions, um, the uh, the difference of uh, uh, the marginal at the root is uh, uh, exponentially small in terms of the distance from V to the configuration. Um, so this is called weak spatial mixing. This is actually equivalent to the uh, uniqueness uh, if we ignore the decay rate part, the exponential part. And uh, what turns out to be useful is another notion called strong spatial mixing uh, for algorithms. Uh, it is that uh, instead of measuring the distance from V to the boundary, we measure the distance from V to where the two configurations differ. So in other words, uh, we kind of allow some uh, branch to terminate early. We can allow some pinnings uh, before uh, the place we want to sort of uh, cut off. And, uh, and those pinnings will be the same for uh, sigma and tau, and uh, we don't measure the distance in terms of those. Uh, so apparently this is stronger because uh, uh, we might as well have no such pinnings. So uh, strong spatial mixing implies weak, and weak is equivalent to uniqueness. Uh, but why this uh, idea, this uh, notion is uh, important is that uh, why it's showed that if we have strong spatial mixing in uh, infinite regular trees, then we have uh, epitas for gra uh, in graphs of a degree less than equal to delta. So this is kind of a uh, sufficient condition for the existence of uh, epitas. So uh, White's idea is uh, basically the following. We kind of want to mimic the tree recursion. We want to use the tree recursion to cal calculate the marginal probabilities in general graphs. Uh, so what we do is we try to break the cycles. And uh, so given a vertex V of like degree D, the first thing we do is we replace it by like D many copies. Then notice that the ratio between the marginal probabilities is equal to the ratio between all the copies being 0 and all the copies being 1. The next, we can rewrite it as a telescoping product uh, of this form. And uh, each of the term can be viewed as a marginal probability ratio uh, of some vi. For example, this one will correspond to v3. And uh, the v1, v2, and v4 in this branch will be pinged according to the 0, 0, and 1s. Um, so in other words, uh, we kind of created a D minor instances of the original graph, but uh, with uh, sort of less uh, vertices. 
uh, and with some boundary conditions to calculate the marginal of the original um, of the marginal of, sorry of the ratio in the original graph. Um, so this leads to the uh, construction of the so-called self-avoiding work trees. Uh, so self-avoiding work tree is essentially the tree of self-avoiding works uh, plus uh, vertices that close the cycles. Uh, so in this uh, construction, uh, if we pick a particular branch, um, then it says as if we walk uh, towards that. And these boundary conditions will not come into play unless we finish a cycle. So that's why we want to uh, include uh, those cycles, the vertices that close cycles, uh, and uh, they should be fixed uh, according to this rule. Like uh, for the branch include uh, corresponding to V3, then V1 and V2, if we match them in the future, then they should be pinned to zero, and uh, V4 should be pinned to one if we met it. We very likely will not see it in the future, actually. Um, so. To doing this from a graph G like this, we will get some uh, trees uh, that uh, say we look at the vertex V. Um, so we get a tree starting of self ordering walks starting from A. And here, like uh, we have walk A to B, then we have A to B, and we have A, C, D, A, which is a cycle. So we get A, C, D, and A. And now A is pinged according to these rules. And uh, now we can calculated the marginal probability in this uh, tree instead of in the original graph. A tree is easy uh, because we can always do the recursion, so dynamic programming from uh, bottom up. Um, but there's a question, uh, there's a problem of this uh, construction that uh, this self opening work tree will be exponential uh, size because otherwise we would uh, solve a number of people problem uh, in polynomial time. So this is exponential size uh, so what's the idea is to truncate this tree, truncate this recursion uh, within polynomial time. So that means uh, within sort of a logarithmic depth. Now, now at the boundary, at the, where we truncate, we don't really know what the true value should be. So we just plug in some uh, arbitrary values. Now the question is how large is the error? And this condition of so-called strong spatial mixing uh, bounds this error. So here is our original tree, and we sort of uh, uh, truncated at the fifth level uh, on these uh, two verses E and F. So their true value should depend on what's below them, but we truncated it so we don't know. We just plug in some random values here. And uh, this strong spatial mixing condition guarantees that uh, whatever the true value is, uh, the influence at the root is very, very small. Uh, it decays uh, exponentially in terms of the, uh, the depth. And uh, this strong the strong part in the strong spatial mixing uh, real, is really useful because we need uh, to deal with these early pinnings uh, that uh, happens before this uh, level. And uh, alternatively, if we have non-uniqueness, uniqueness, um, for example, we just have a tree, regular tree, uh, then if it's non-unique, then of course we have a constant error in this scheme because when we uh, truncate, we really need to know what the true value is to recover the, uh, the margin at the root. Okay. So this is how Weiss algorithm goes. And uh, so now we know that uh, if it's beyond the uniqueness, um, then the size and the address at all and the size soon results show that uh, beyond the uniqueness is hard. And the Weiss results show that uh, before strong spatial mixing, we have an algorithm. Um, but the question is whether these two are the same. And this is uh, established for all antiferrous to Smith systems by uh, Sinclair, Shrift, Savan, and Thurley, and also Li Luan in, uh, in several papers. So this is true. And uh, therefore, for antiferro to Smith systems, the uniqueness is equivalent to strong spatial mixing, uh, which in turn is equivalent to the existence of uh, f -petas. And now you may notice that uh, this uniqueness is defined for a uh, bounded degree graphs are like a, uh, infinite regular trees of a certain degree. So for general graphs, uh, we require the uniqueness to hold for all integer degrees. Um, so this will not uh, be true for like say independent set because the threshold of independent set will go to zero if d goes to infinity. Uh, and also for like a easy model. 
it is also uh, will not hold for general graphs. Uh, but it, there exists some uh, beta and gamma, so that this is true. And uh, uh, what happens there is that uh, the uh, this uh, sphere hold uh, is not uh, uh, not monotone. So there exists a peak, and uh, if our field is larger than the peak, then uh, the link is hold for any uh, degrees. So for Again, for, for anti ferro systems, we have this perfect correspondence among uniqueness, strong spatial mixing, and uh, FPTAS. Uh, now the question is, uh, can we generalize that to uh, ferromagnetic uh, spin systems? And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, so one typical example is the ferromagnetic easing model. Again, it is easing, so we have beta larger than 1. Uh, we have this uh, beta 1, 1 beta interaction, and we have no field, I'd say. Uh, this is very well studied. We understood the, we understood the, uh, the phase transition in infinite regular trees long ago. There exists a, a critical beta C, which is like a delta over delta minus 2. And when delta goes to infinity, this just goes to 1. And therefore, there's no uh, beta such that uh, this holds for all de inter degrees. Uh, however, we have the algorithm due to Jerome and uh, Sinclair that even for general graphs, uh, not necessarily bounded degree, we always have uh, FP ROS. That is based on Markov chains. Uh, for, so we do have algorithm even if the uniqueness failed. Um, so the, the question is like, uh, um, so what, what is the truth? Like, uh, what is, should be the criteria for this case? Um, the interesting thing about the uh, Jeremy Sinclair chain is that it works in the uh, subgraph world instead of the original uh, easing world. And uh, it is shown to be fast mixing for any easing model. Uh, and, uh, if and, so if the fields are sort of consistent, so suppose we have like a non-uniform uh, field lambda v for different v's, and uh, if they are all uh, larger than one or all less than one, then this chain is fast mixing, and even if the uniqueness of strong spatial mixing fails. Uh, so this is extended to uh, general beta gamma case. Let's assume beta less than equal to gamma because they are really uh, symmetric. Um, so this uh, of one is generalized to like a beta uh, gamma over beta. So it first generalized to square root of this by Goldberg, Jeremy, Patterson, and later to come over beta by Liu, Lu, and Zhang. Uh, so what really happens here is that uh, since beta is less than uh, gamma, so edges will favor gamma. And uh, this ratio gamma over beta will be larger than 1, therefore versus favors uh, uh, by beta. So versus and edges favor different uh, spins. Therefore, there's certain tension among them, and the question is, so the, the Criteria is like uh, if the tension is not so strong, then we can have an algorithm. If it is too strong, then uh, the algorithm would fail. And if uh, vertices and the edges both favor sort of the same spin, let's say beta, uh, then the problem is easy due to the Jeremy Sinclair algorithm. So here is a picture for uh, ferro two spin systems. We have a beta one and gamma, and we have some non uniform field, lambda v. So for general graphs, um, so this is an uh, algorithm based on Jeremy Sinclair chain uh, due to Liu Luan and Zhang. Uh, we have this square hold of gamma over beta. And in the same paper, they also show that uh, the problem becomes uh, uh, beats hard uh, if it's, uh, lambda is larger than a certain quantity, uh, which I call lambda c int. Uh, so here, beats hard is like the optimal result because uh, all the problems uh, in Faro world is uh, uh, B is easy, so this is really like B is equivalent. You can't get anything harder than B. Um, so this quantity lambda c int uh, is defined by this uh, gamma over beta to a certain power, uh, which is delta c to the uh, the floor of delta c plus one over two. Uh, as it indicates, this is, I call it a lambda c int because I have another quantity lambda c, which is just gamma over beta to the delta c over two. Uh, notice that if delta c is very, very close to an integer, uh, then this quantity and this quantity are very, very close. But if it, it is an integer, then it's actually different by one. Um, so what we showed is that uh, 
for all lambda less than this lambda c, um, a certain kind of uh, spatial mixing holds, which I call conditional spatial mixing, and I will uh, explain it in the next slide. And uh, this is sort of a weaker version of strong spatial mixing, and it doesn't quite imply an algorithm. Uh, but it does for a special case when beta is less than or equal to 1, uh, less than or equal to gamma. So when beta is less than or equal to 1, so it's like uh, the, verse, the edge is uh, strongly not favoring beta, uh, then our uh, conditional spatial mixing actually implies f betas. Uh, but if beta is larger than 1, uh, it doesn't have any algorithmic uh, implication. Uh, so this is some uh, joint work with uh, uh, PNU. Okay. So what do I mean by this uh, conditional spatial mixing? Uh, it is as follows. So in some sense, the strong spatial mixing is to guard against the worst case pinnings in the self avoiding work tree. Uh, so instead of that, we only allow sort of good pinnings. We only allow uh, boundary conditions that are dominated by uh, like isolated vertices. So that means uh, the margin of uh, the boundary condition is less than or equal to lambda over 1 plus lambda or intuitively, all vertices are leaning towards the sort of good spin. And we show that uh, this, when this, the pinning uh, satisfies this, then these uh, conditional spatial mixing holds for any tree the, without any boundary degree. And uh, it's not, also not uh, necessarily uh, regular. So this is a picture of uh, strong spatial mixing. We have this uh, uh, self-avoiding work tree and then we kind of uh, uh, truncate it at a certain level, and then we want to compare the influence of all blue versus all red in this tree. Uh, but this does not satisfy uh, our conditional spatial mixing um, because uh, we have these red pinnings, red are kind of the bad pinning, let's say. Um, so instead, uh, we are asking, uh, suppose this pinning is all blue, and uh, uh, does it decay? And uh, moreover, we cannot allow, like, uh, we cannot uh, compare all blue to all red. Instead, we can allow sort of all blue to all white. And here we allow blue pinning that we can allow up to sort of a white pinning, but not uh, any, anything red. And we show that uh, if these are satisfied, then the all blue over all white is kind of a decays, influence decays uh, exponentially in the uh, distance. Uh, if we look at uh, all blue over all red, it's actually not true, this uh, decay. Um, okay, but this is not what happened in a self-avoiding work tree. Uh, why does our uh, spatial mixing imply any algorithm? That is because the edge is uh, sort of a strongly unfavored beta. Therefore, given a self-avoiding work tree, originally it's like this. Um, we can remove those uh, red pinnings and uh, effectively, what, it, what this removing does is it gives a field on the, on the appearance. And as the picture indicates, uh, when, I, when we remove those, uh, when beta is less than or equal to 1, the, the apparent will actually favor blue. Uh, it will not be as strong as blue, but it will be some less blue, um, but it's still blue. It's not red. That's the point. So, and also for the boundary condition, we know that uh, down there, uh, the sort of the marginal is also um, not red, and it's uh, like dominated by all white. So we can safely compare all blue with uh, all white. So in other case, uh, so in other sense, in other words, um, we establish that in this case, the conditional spatial mixing uh, implies uh, strong spatial mixing. So this is enough for algorithm. So what happened uh, when beta is larger than 1? Again, we can still do this pruning stuff, but uh, there's a problem that uh, after we remove these red pinnings, the apparent is still leaning towards red. It's like less red, but uh, it's still red. Uh, so our, our, uh, our condition doesn't really hold for these uh, uh, strong uh, for these self avoiding work trees. Um, but we do have an observation that if lambda v is less than this critical lambda c, uh, then the marginal probability for any graph, any vertex, is actually less than or equal to lambda over 1 plus lambda. Uh, so in some sense, for any graph, if we look at any vertex, there are always, uh, uh, if this condition holds, 
they are always uh, uh, leaning towards uh, the good spin. Um, but it's just that when we do the self ordering work tree construction, we need to do this uh, uh, telescoping product, and uh, we will artificially create a lot of red pinnings, which cause a problem. Um, so the sort of open question is that can we get a FP task uh, without this uh, strong spatial mixing condition? And uh, uh, indeed, we, uh, we have some results. So there's some joint work with uh, uh, Bezokova, Stefankovic, Kalanis, and uh, Goldberg. Uh, we have some FP task without strong spatial mixing for like hypergraph infant set problem. Uh, but it's not clear how to apply those techniques in this uh, setting. Uh, so I think this is kind of the major open problem for this uh, uh, for this problem for for this uh, model. Okay, and uh, oh, before I go into that, uh, mm, uh, yeah, it's more. Um, so another question is, what is the exact threshold? Uh, Remember, we have this lambda c and lambda c int. They uh, differ by a, so a very small gap. Uh, however, we notice that neither of these are the, uh, the red bond. So none of them is tight. There exists some uh, small interval beyond lambda c uh, where the FP does still exist. That is because the integrate has to be integers. So remember, in the lambda c, we have some delta c stuff, which is not necessarily an integer. Uh, that kind of works as the degree for our algorithm. Um, but the degree has to be integers. So uh, we can actually show there exists a small interval beyond that. There exists, uh, still exists algorithm. And also, for lambda less than this uh, lambda c int, um, we actually can construct an example such that a strong spatial mixing fails. Uh, so in other words, uh, it says that uh, if the non uniqueness so if the uniqueness for if the regular trace holds for all integer degree delta, we still don't have a strong spatial mixing. So this is very different from the anti ferro case. Uh, this is even if like a beta less than u to one. Um, so this construction is actually an irregular tree. So let's say the delta c is six. So sort of what's the degree is six? Um, then instead of a six regular tree. We construct a irregular tree with degrees five and seven and five and seven and so on, like a sort of alternating degrees. Then we observe that this, um, the correlation decay in such an irregular tree is worse than the uh, infinite regular trees. Um, so in the anti ferro case, we can view infinite regular trees as the worst case scenario. But in the in the ferro case, uh, it's not true anymore. Even even if uh, beta less than one, which is sort of an easy case. So the question is, uh, where is the tight threshold between these two? So we kind of observe neither of those are tight. Okay. And uh, at last, I will uh, talk about a complex easing model. Uh, so everything is the same as before. We have the easing model beta 1 1 beta, and we have no field. So we want to compute this quantity. Now, the only twist is that if not beta may be a complex number. And again, the exact evaluation is well understood. Uh, this is due to uh, some result uh, a long time ago by J.J. Vertigan and uh, Welsh. So this is uh, number very hard unless some uh, sort of trivial cases when beta is 0 or plus minus 1 or plus minus r. Uh, so this is, uh, becomes interesting for us. It's due to some kind of re uh, recent result by uh, Fuji and Mori May. Uh, so they show that there exists a quantum circuit called IQP, um, such that if you can evaluate this partition function at a root of unity, then you can simulate those quantum circuits. Or oh, evaluate the norm of the partition function at the root of unity. Then you can simulate the, uh, the quantum circuits. And they continue to draw conclusions about these using some quantum mechanics. Um, but that begs the question, like, uh, what really is the complexity of uh, approximating these norms without using uh, any quantum? Like, uh, can we say something, f use sort of a classical techniques? So here is a picture. Um, here is the approximation complexity of uh, this uh, norm of the partition. And in fact, uh, we allow, uh, we are not very strict if the, if the partition function is zero. 
So you may kind of expect that hardness comes from uh, zeros of the planar function um, if beta is like a complex number, but we kind of allow arbitrary output if uh, this really is zero. So even for the relaxed version, what I'm going to talk about is still true. So here is a complex plane. And first, we have this uh, tractable result due to a long time ago. Uh, we have these five points, 0 and uh, plus minus 1, plus minus i, are tractable. And the general Sinclair chain told us it's, uh, uh, we have a appearance if beta is larger than 1. And uh, in the same paper, they showed that uh, uh, the problem is np hard if beta is between 0 and 1. And uh, later on, uh, Goldberg and Jerome showed that uh, if we are less than 0 but larger than minus 1, the problem is still np hard. And if we are less than minus 1, then the problem actually is equivalent to counting profit matchings, approximately counting profit matchings in general graphs. Um, this is still an open question. We have the, uh, the FPRAS for bipartite graphs, for counting profit matchings in bipartite graphs, but we don't know the general uh, complexity, approximation complexity. Uh, so this is what happens when beta is real. And the first thing we show is that other than these uh, real axes, other than these two tractable points, everything else is NP hard. Uh, so this is sort of our first result. It kind of completes the picture, uh, except that not quite. Because when beta is between 0 and minus 1, it's actually number P hard to approximate this norm. So if the, if the quantity we want to compute is like a within, uh, uh, within number p, then we can use the NP oracle to approximate it. Um, but here, this, uh, these quantities are not necessarily in number p because they have negative numbers or complex numbers. So to approximate this quantity is actually number p hard. So we strengthened this uh, hardness result of NP hardness to number p hardness. And uh, this used the idea that is employed earlier by Goldberg and Jerome about determining the, uh, the sign of the Tata polynomial. So basically, given an oracle of uh, approximating the norm of this uh, uh, Padinian function, we can do a bisection argument to recover the answer to some uh, number p hard problem. Okay, so, so based on this, we kind of reduce, uh, we do reductions to other points. For example, for the points of interest, the root of unities, and or more generally, any beta that is, has norm 1 uh, on this unit cycle, in the circle, um, they are all number p hard. And uh, from that, we can show that uh, everything on the imaginary axis is number p hard. And uh, for most of the point, like at least half of the points, uh, it's like a number p hard. Uh, apparently, I cannot draw a points of this sort because it will cover the whole plane. Um, we conjecture actually every point should be never be hard, but uh, we can't quite show that. Uh, we show that many points are hard. Excuse me, what is the meaning of sharp PM? Oh, this is the counting perfect matchings. So this is like a still an open question. Uh, we, we have an algorithm to count perf approximately count perfect matchings in bipartite graphs. That's the Jeremy Sinclair the gold algorithm. But uh, it doesn't uh, generalize to uh, like a arbitrary graphs, if it's not bipartite. But it's not the same as in the talk by Leslie, the counting bipartite independent set. It oh, it's not this. It's not this. Uh, it's like a different uh, open problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is like both are open, but uh, we don't know their relationship. Like uh, maybe they are equivalent, but we don't know. Maybe they are both hard. Uh, so this is pretty much the picture, and uh, I guess I don't really have time to talk about the proof, so i briefly go through this. So basically, we, uh, this is what I said. We want the relaxed version, and we reduce from this uh, problem uh, called the minimal cardinality SD card, which is shown to be number very hard for problem and ball. Um, and we use this uh, sign hardness uh, technique, and uh, the the reduction is that we sort of rewrite the, the partition function as a linear function of in some variable x that we can tweak. And then we can do some uh, bisection argument uh, given the norm of the partition functions. And we can conclude, we can find out where the zero is. And using the zero, we can uh, find out the uh, quantity we want to compute. 
And uh, we also have some uh, further result of like, complex easing with fields. Uh, here we only consider the case when beta, gamma, beta and lambda are roots of unity, uh, because this is sort of an interesting case for quantum computation. And also we have some result for like, uh, approximating the argument, the, the angle of the Padinger function. So this is again related to quantum uh, due to some result by Bolovich, Friedman, Lovatz, and Welsh. Um, so they asked uh, this question for Tata polynomial has certain points on planar graphs. Uh, we show this uh, number behind for general graphs. So uh, it's kind of an indication that this should be hard, uh, but we don't quite show that. Okay. Um, so that's about it. Uh, let's finish with some uh, open questions. So for any ferro to spin system, uh, the major open question is uh, what about the approximation complexity at the threshold? Uh, we know that the correlation does decay, but it decays not with the exponential rate, it decays with some polynomial rate. Uh, so this only gives us a approximation for log partition rather than partition function itself. And uh, for Ferro's systems, uh, the question is what happens when beta larger than one? Uh, do we have a Peters when this condition holds? We conjecture there should be one. Um, we don't know. A less ambitious question is, can we show this conditional spatial mixing for graphs instead of trees? So what we show is trees. Um, for graphs, intuitively, you can pick a, a spanning tree and uh, you add edges. And uh, because the uh, edges favor gamma, when, like, whenever you add edges, it should uh, uh, make the decay stronger and stronger. Um, but it's very hard to formalize this uh, intuition. So intuitively, it should be true, but we don't know how to prove it. Um, also, uh, another open question is how to avoid the, the gap in the hardness proof. So what I showed earlier is for non-uniform field. If we want to show hardness for uniform field, uh, we need to construct gadgets. Then gadgets are sort of combinatorial. There will be an integrality gap again. Uh, so how to avoid that gap seems to be a uh, difficult question. Um, we can do the random regular bipartite graph construction as in address talked about uh, in the last talk. Um, but the problem is we, have, we, will, we will have two faces, but uh, the one face will dominate the other. So we can't use that for the hardness proof. So this is another question, another open question on how to avoid uh, this gadget gap. Uh, okay, that's it. Thanks.